This is the SF Productions Podcast Network. Hey Network, stay in your own lane. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. You can check out our audio podcast, How I Get My Wife to Read Comics, on iTunes, or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. In the relentless march to 500 cable channels, yeah. it's vital that each network create an identity that viewers will remember in the morass of the on-screen guide. Yes. Mm-hmm. So why do successful networks change their identity or even their name? Perhaps you might end up more successful or you might get lost in the shuffle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> ESPN's really a rarity now. It's a network that's basically doing what they did on day one, maybe a bigger budget, and they're the same name. <laughs> yeah, they're and they're sports. <laughs> and they're know? sports. They and really ESPN is is you know synonymous exactly. with sports. But there are some other networks that have changed lanes over time. Starting with Bravo in 1980, it actually began as a pay cable network with commercial free schedule that was heavy on like symphony, ballet, and opera. Yeah, like Bravo, Bravo. Yes. It only ran two days a week, sharing the channel with adult pay cable network Escapade. Mm-hmm. <laughs> by the end of the 80s, they had converted to basic cable. And then by the early 2000s, they moved to reality show format as part of the big reality boom. Mm-hmm. They introduced more diversity starting in 2003 with Queer Eye for the Straight Guy and courted gay viewers going forward with such shows as Real Housewives, That Franchise, and Top Chef. Mm -hmm. They introduced scripted shows in 2014 with Girlfriends with Guide to Divorce. So they went from a PBS light (laughs) to gay-friendly reality shows. Yes. (laughs) Bravo! Bravo! 1981, MTV. Music television. Depending on who you believe, the channel was created to A. Amortize the cost RCA generated in a f- in failed music-based video discs. So the old SpectraVision with the, okay. the square thing, they made these video albums. Mm-hmm. And RCA, they never really sold. So they said, we have all these videos, what do we do with them? Mm-hmm. B, expand the local show Sight on Sound that was on Columbus, Ohio's Cube two-way cable concept. C, expand the local New York show Album Tracks that was created by the original formatter for MTV, Robert Pittman. Or D, expand Michael Nesmith's Pop Pop Clips TV show, which was based on a New Zealand series from the 70s. Okay. So one of those four was the Genesis. Or all four of them together. Yeah. In any case, MTV really radically changed TV as a whole. Mm Mm-hmm. You can look at commercials pre- and post-MTV. Before MTV, there would regularly be three to four seconds of silence at the end of an ad just showing the product. (laughs) (laughs) It just... Here it is. Yeah. Here's the product. I can't even last two yeah. seconds. That would be heresy today. MTV also hugely impacted record sales. If you wanted to sell your records, you suddenly had to have a music video. And back then, MTV was all music videos. Right. There was nothing else on MTV. Yeah. They even had copycat channels. There was the cable music channel, which was one of Turner's networks, that never made any money, so MTV bought it and renamed it VH1. Mm-hmm. By the late 1980s, MTV started to move away from music videos. They had a fashion show called House of Style. They had a game show called Remote Control. And in 1992, MTV invented, really, the modern reality show with the real world. Mm -hmm. They later did a late night talk show with some guy named Jon Stewart. (laughs) By the 2000s, they were all about reality. 2002, The Osbournes, 2003, Punked. 2006, My Super Sweet 16 and The Hills, and 2009, The Jersey Shore. Music videos have now mostly moved to the internet. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They're all on YouTube now. Yeah, you'd be hard-pressed to find a music video on MTV. Right. 1983, the Nashville Network launches. 
It started as an attempt to expand the MTV formula to country music. Mm -hmm. MTV had just started like two days earlier <laughs> their own country music channel, CMT. The Nashville network included live shows from the Grand Ole Opry. And it quickly changed hands then and expanded into other formats, but all were related in some way to country music. Mm -hmm. 1991, TNN bought out CMT and pushed all music video programming to them. In the 90s, they moved into southern sports, such as hunting and fishing <laughs> and motorsports. And then in 1997, TNN changed hands again, and all country entertainment programming was phased out in favor of sports and added roller derby and wrestling. 2000. TNN was renamed the National Network, not Nashville, but National Network, mm -hmm. and got into syndicated shows aimed at a younger male demographic. 2003, TNN was renamed Spike TV, later Spike. Mm -hmm. In 2011, they expanded their lineup for older males because they were shooting for that elusive 18 to 49 market. Mm -hmm. So they went from country music videos to video game awards. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 1984, Arts and Entertainment Network, a.k.a. A&E, launched. Mm -hmm. Began as a three-hour nightly block using Nickelodeon's channel because kids weren't up in order to watch cartoons. Now, I don't know. Okay, yeah, you're going to mention I'm going to talk about Nick at Night. Nick at Night. Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> they later got their own 24-hour slot, and then Nick filled that nightly slot with Nick at Night, and we'll discuss more about that in a second. I always remember that was so confusing to me when I first started watching cable <laughs> that, you know, oh, that's now we're something not else. Nick, Nickelodeon at Night. That's A&E. Yeah. A &E. yeah. Very weird. <laughs> the formatting was similar to early Bravo, but then they rapidly moved to syndicated shows like Law and & Order and Night Court. Mm -hmm. They also began to do hourly documentaries such as Biography, later to get its own channel, which later changed as well to FYI, a reality show network. 2002, A&E jumped into early reality programming. As like you'll see, a lot of networks did. Dog the Bounty Hunter, Duck Dynasty, Storage Wars, and true crime shows like Cold Case Files. Mm -hmm. And then in 2010, in that in 2010s, another jump, this time into more scripted shows like Bates Hotel, although reality is really still their bread and butter. Mm -hmm. 1984, American Movie Classics, AMC, launches, began as a premium channel showing classic films only a few hours a day, but by 1990 they had moved to basic cable and 24-hour schedule. Mm-hmm. Also in 1990, AMC began this film preservation festival showing lost films and generating interest in saving other otherwise lost films. Mm -hmm. 1998, a program called American Pop moved into more modern 50s and 60s movies. And they also began adding commercial breaks during movies at that point. Yeah, I know. Which is when I kind of lost, lost interest. interest. Yeah. yeah. 2002, they expanded their lineup to all movies, mm -hmm. so there wasn't just classic, but all, any movie. 2007, AMC debuted their original drama series, Mad Men, which really changed the whole focus of the network mm -hmm. over time. 2008, Breaking Bad. 2011, Walking Dead. So, all to huge critical and ratings acclaim. So they went from old movies to new TV dramas. Now, I mentioned Nick and Knight earlier. It began, as I said, an overnight block in 1985 to Nickelodeon, because again, kids weren't up at night to watch cartoons. Right. The mix of classic shows, many of which had not been seen in decades, made a very popular lineup. So popular, in fact, it was spun off as a separate channel, originally called Nick at Night's TV Land in 1996. Now, I found the grand opening of TV Land on YouTube. I have it on VHS somewhere. <laughs> I need to convert it. It actually choked me up a little bit. They started with really kitschy intros and interstitials to go along with the shows. Mm -hmm. At one point, they did this mockumentary that introduced the other actress <laughs> who played the back of Patty Duke's head on her show, who was never seen, of course. Yes. And even in the document, this mockumentary, you just see the back of her head and she's talking. Mm -hmm. They also created what they called 60-second sitcoms skewering tropes of sitcoms. One of them was called Spin and Cutter was a perfect Strangers-esque show with a character saying, well, I'm not wearing that. These, these screen spins and cuts to, 
we, him wearing it, how do I look? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, by 1999, they tied for the 10th most popular cable network along with ESPN. <laughs> in the 2000s, the TV Land Awards begin honoring classic shows and stars, and they also began installing statues of classic stars in their fictional hometown. Mm -hmm. Now, we've uh, I'm kind of on a, a quest to hit to all of these. We visited the Fonz in Milwaukee. And Andy Taylor and Opie in Mount Airy, mm -hmm. a.k.a. Mayberry, North Carolina. Really need to get to the Bob Hartley chair and couch in Chicago. Isn't there a Mary Tyler Moore one? Too? In in Minneapolis. Yeah. Yeah. 2007, the network expands into more recent shows, with the more classic shows moving to a late night block. Mm -hmm. Putting them in the ghetto. Mm -hmm. 2010, TV Land decided to make their own classic style sitcoms, new ones, making... Uh, these using these classic sitcom stars, Hot in Cleveland, Retired at 35, mm -hmm. 2015, TV Land joined the model of F FX and began creating more modern shows such as The Jim Gaffigan Show and Younger. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the classic TV reigns have pretty much been taken over by Diginets, yes. like MeTV, which is really the closest to TV Land, mm -hmm. Antenna TV, Cozy, and others. Yes. I could go on on many more examples, like sci-fi becoming siffy and showing wrestling. <laughs> or the, all the family channel things. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> we, we might even do a second episode of this because there are a lot more examples. But you get the idea. Yeah, and, and, and really the family channel one just always freaks me out. <laughs> ABC Family, yeah. Mm. Now we're showing like... <laughs> So don't watch ABC Family now, yeah. if you're a family. Well, you can't because it's called Freeform now. Yeah. <laughs> so while you're not watching that, you can check out our audio podcast, How I Got My Wife to Read Comics on iTunes, or on our website, sfpodcastnetwork.com. From the Pop Culture Bunker, I'm Mindy. And I'm Mark. Thanks for watching. <laughs>